So it was about mid-April when we started to see the headlines. Former Vice President Joe Biden putting together post-election transition team, talks cabinet makeup. Then in June, Biden builds out his transition operation. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe you thought it was a little early for a campaign to start thinking about a transition. But like most things 2020, you've got to be prepared for anything and everything. So we at the Raven Group thought we'd jump in on this somewhat presumptuous conversation and pull back the curtain on the mysterious world of presidential transitions. This will give you all an opportunity to have a better understanding about how a presidential transition works and what you can do to make the most out of the time between election day and inauguration. And the reality is even presidents who are reelected still have a transition period to prepare for their second term. So regardless of outcomes, this is a good conversation for us to have. I'm Jessica McCall. I'm a principal here at the Raven Group, joining you today from Detroit. And I've had some transition experience at the state level, having worked on gubernatorial transitions for both former Governor Jennifer Granholm and current Governor Gretchen Whitmer. But our guest today has us covered with all things presidential transition. With over 20 years in public service, Chris Liu has served in all three branches of the federal government. In addition to his previous work in Congress and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, Liu served seven years in the Obama administration as both Deputy Secretary of Labor and the White House Cabinet Secretary. Currently, Chris is the Teresa A. Sullivan Practitioner Senior Fellow at UVA's Miller Center, a Senior Strategy Advisor at Fiscal Note, a DC-based technology company, and he keeps us all sane as the voice of reason and by providing his meaningful perspective as a commentator on both television and radio, as well as podcasts. Chris is here with us today because he has a unique understanding of the inner workings of a presidential transition, having served as the executive director of the Obama-Biden transition project. Please, let's welcome Chris Liu. Chris, thanks That's for great. joining us. Thank you. Good to be on. Good to see you. So uh, President Obama gave you a tremendous compliment, especially considering what we've seen over the past three years, um, that you oversaw one of the most stable and effective cabinets in history. So tell us, what did you know that seems to not come through in the current administration about managing a cabinet? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me as well as the Raven Group and all of the people uh, on today's uh, Zoom call. I know there's probably no measure of, no small measure of Zoom fatigue these days. So anyone spending their time with us for an hour, I appreciate. You know, running the president's uh, cabinet was really much like the other roles I did for President Obama, whether it was being his legislative director in the Senate or managing his presidential transition. It's an understanding of what his priorities were, how to find the right people uh, to take the positions, whether it was, you know, Senate staffers, transition staff, or uh, at the highest level, the cabinet, and understanding how all the pieces come together and how they sync up with each other, as well as sync up with the president's priorities. Uh, and these are incredibly hard jobs, but they were a heck of a lot of fun. That's right. And so when did you and President Obama begin talking about transition and how did you get to become executive director? Well, we started talking about it in April of 2008. And uh, for those of you that can go back 12 years, you'll remember, you know, we were still in the middle of a heated primary contest against Senator Clinton that would go for, you know, another month and a half, two months or so. And then we obviously had a general election campaign to go through. And one of the reasons we started working so early on presidential transition is that we understood the unique nature of transitions, that on January 20th of, you know, every four or eight years, you know, the senior leadership of the federal government, about 4,000 people leave, mm -hmm. uh, and then a new group of people come in. You wouldn't run a company that way. You would not run a university that way. And yet we're able to do it, or we do do it every four to eight years in the federal government, the biggest and most powerful organization in the world. And mm -hmm. simply to start planning it between election day and uh, inauguration day is simply not enough time. So we understood we had to start planning early, in part because it was the first 9-11 transition. And also the president and I, President Obama and I had this 
fondness for this uh, old movie. It's not that old to me, but it probably is to other people. Uh, the movie is The Candidate. It's a 1972 movie starring mm -hmm. Robert Redford. Uh, he plays uh, an idealistic senator who runs for, uh, idealistic environmentalist who runs for the US Senate and then wins. And in the final scene, he's about to walk on stage and declare victory. And before he goes on stage, he says to one of his aides, now what do I do? And we <laughs> never wanted to be standing there in Grand Park on election night declaring victory and saying, now what? And so that's right. when we started planning so early. Yeah. And it's really one of the things that makes the government so special, these, these um, traditions and norms that we have. And right now we're seeing all of these headlines and clickbait <laughs> and, you know, any reasonable American is going to be a little bit alarmed about it. So what can you do to help us advance our understanding of how transition works, who actually manages it? You know, what, what, um, uh, what's put in place to ensure that there is a smooth transition? You know, the uh, transition from uh, George W. Bush to Barack Obama is considered the most successful transition in recent history. And President Obama has always been publicly grateful and thankful to uh, President Bush for the cooperation we received. So it does require bipartisan cooperation, and that's something that is sorely lacking these days. But mm -hmm. and and I think there is reason, frankly, for people to be concerned about uh, what a transition could look like, particularly if we have a close election. Where I take some comfort, however, is that the transition process has been institutionalized in a way that wasn't the case in 2008. Congress has passed three pieces of legislation uh, that have formalized the process and ensure that it is happening, and that's largely run by career staff and. In fact, it is run by career staff. In each of the mm -hmm. agencies, um, career officials prepare the briefing materials. They're the ones that will be welcoming the new officials and providing briefings to all of them. There's the machinery of government well beneath the White House that is preparing for this transition. But you know, make no mistake, obviously the message gets sent from the top. President Bush uh, started you know, thinking about a transition uh, at the end of uh, year seven of his administration. And he instructed his chief of staff, Josh Bolton, to provide full cooperation to whichever side won. And so that message from the top really does make the difference between a smooth transition and one that is not. Mm -hmm. Can we take a minute to give some love to career staff? I mean, they've really been the unsung heroes over these past several years and always, but, um, you know, kind of keeping things uh, from being as as concerning as they could be. No, I think that's an important point. I mean, look, you know, those of us in Washington spend our times consumed with political battles, but, you know, mm -hmm. understand that the vast majority of what happens in the federal government is not political. It's getting money out the door to help the American people. It's enforcing laws. It's protecting national security. It's protecting homeland security. Um, it's just making sure that government programs run well. And uh, yeah, so we should be absolutely thankful to career civil servants. Yeah. Yeah. So, and thinking about presidential appointments. So unlike you, you said there are 4,000 um, uh, people that are going to need to be transitioned and we have numerous vacancies um, going in to a possible transition. So um, if, if you were considering going in, um, is this a great time to go in considering all the, the chaos? Is this an exciting time to go into the federal government or is it more like be careful what you wish for? Well, look, you know, I, I have spent 20 years in, in political government type jobs and I've loved every one of them. Um, I think there's no greater personal fulfillment than, than, uh, than serving in government, but understand their sacrifices. There's certainly the monetary sacrifice. There's mm -hmm. also the scrutiny that political appointees are under. Um, and these are really hard jobs. And, you know, depending on where you serve, you could be serving in an agency that is badly demoralized, that's been gutted. Um, but even agencies that are doing well, um, the day-to-day -day management of the programs that government has are, is hard. Um, and, you know, it, you don't often have the tools you need. Uh, you, you don't often have the resources you need, but these are great jobs. And so I do encourage people who are interested in serving uh, to consider it, you know, notwithstanding certainly the downsides. 
Mm -hmm. So thinking about scrutiny, we, you know, we've, we've kind of seen over the past few years, um, an administration thumb their nose essentially at scrutiny. And if you are considering a presidential appointment, a couple questions here, one, how do you position yourself? And then two, how do you prepare for the scrutiny? You know, um, first of all, understand, uh, getting one of these jobs is not the easiest thing. Um, you know, back in 2008, uh, we had about a hundred thousand resumes that came in the door, um, you know, for, as I said, about 4,000 positions. And even I think the hundred thousand probably minimizes the number of, um, inquiries that were sent our way. So, um, the chance of any, any individual person getting a job is small. Um, like everything else in Washington, you have to be qualified and you probably have to have some level of connections as well. Um, those connections can be in many ways. Obviously, there's a big pipeline of people from uh, Capitol Hill uh, to the uh, administration, as well as all the you know various government affairs shops in D.C., whether it's with a private company or nonprofits or trade associations. Uh, there are people who have served at state and local government. Uh, there are people who have served in the private sector or philanthropy. You know, what you really want in government is the best and brightest. And um, so it, it you, you want to get a diversity of people. That means it's a very big pool of people. Um, but a lot of people decide, you know what, I don't really want the sacrifices of this. These are not, um, as I said, there's not easy jobs. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obviously, you know, you have to sort of show that you have some connection with a candidate that you have, um, you have supported him or her in some way. Um, so it's not easy, but, um, obviously I'm guessing the people who might be listening in on this call, uh, are tend to be the kind of people who are both substantively good and probably politically connected as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, hypothetically speaking, you know, if, What's happened over the, the past uh, uh, three and a half, four years when it comes to um, appointments and uh, again, going back to the scrutiny and the vetting process, um, you know, if, if you are someone who might have a, a bit more of a, um, um, a, a few tweets that, that might not be <laughs> too favorable, <laughs> you know, you, um, maybe, you know, it seems like we are not that good at living in the gray area, the nuance of being a human being. Like if we're not, um, completely, uh, on the right side of everything, it seems really hard, especially in, in, um, uh, more, on, more so on the Democratic and progressive side to get appointments, to get yeah. Senate confirmation. You talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, uh, you know, when I went through the confirmation process and I think traditionally, you know, you, as I said, you have to be qualified. That's the most important thing. They obviously want to check your legal history, you know, mm -hmm. any arrests uh, tend to be disqualifying, uh, financial uh, problems, uh, you know, bankruptcies, conflicts of interest, uh, anything in your past that might be sort of problematic legally or financially. But we have now, and again, it, this is not to say public statements weren't relevant before. If you were somebody who was on TV a lot or if you've given a lot of speeches, mm -hmm. uh, those would be scrutinized. But boy, we're in a completely different universe now where, yes. you know, many of us live uh, live and breathe social media uh, we have, I just checked, I think I have 21,000 tweets and God yeah. help the person who has to vet me next to read all 21,000. Um, okay. and I had, when I went through the confirmation process in, in 20, um, in 2013, I think I had tweeted like 10 times, mostly right. about baseball. So, um, I, I, this, we're in a whole new world now and, and I'm not, I'll be candid. I don't know what the standards are. Um, and, and I don't know what the standards are, particularly since, um, as you say, um, social media doesn't necessarily lend itself to subtlety and nuance. Mm -hmm. And um, especially in, in an era of Donald Trump, and there's nothing subtle or nuanced about the president. And, you know, my defense, when I go up for confirmation, if I'm privileged to do it again, is whatever I tweeted wasn't half as bad as what the presidential tweet I was reacting to. I don't know if that's going to pass muster or not. I mean, I think- right. We, we do need to sort of distinguish between 
people engaging in the normal political rhetoric of this period, which is admittedly is very heated mm-hmm. for people who are making statements on social media that are, you know, blatantly racist or people that are um, dispensing conspiracy theories or people that are really engaging in hateful conduct. I don't think we know where those lines are. So it'll be interesting to see with this next administration, how all of this plays out. Yeah. Yeah. And for our viewers today, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the in the comments, we will definitely be taking, have a Q&A portion of the conversation today. So um, I'm an executive director in Muscatine, Iowa, and I run an organization that's working to combat childhood hunger. And I, I wanna make sure there's no disruption in providing meals to children during a pandemic. And I want uh, the White House to support my issue. What are some of the steps that organizations can take in order to move their agenda through an administration, even present it to either a transition or an administration in order to uh, uh, be successful? You know, I, I let me let me take your example and sort of tweak it slightly. I mean, I would yeah. suggest that if you are the executive director of an organization in, in a state, you might want to work with your national affiliate to, to make it a bigger <clears throat> issue. That's mm-hmm. the only tweak I'll make to your example. Um, okay. I, I'll give four, four sort of easy tips. I think one is try to align your policy proposal with a campaign promise that the candidate has made. We'll say in this instance, uh, Vice President Biden, um, one of his campaign promises, something in the Democratic platform uh, or some congressional priority. Um, and, and again, that's not to say that if you have a completely out of the blue idea, um, that it stands no chance. Uh, I'll give you an example, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Again, not to say that that was an out of the blue idea, but this was a concept that Elizabeth Warren has wrote about when she was a law professor. Now, again, I've not gone back to look at the Obama campaign promises, whether this was in there, but look, this was kind of a unique thing that because the force of Elizabeth Warren was able to push it. But it does help for most proposals that they be grounded in something that the president-elect or his or her party has talked about or have talked about in some way. So that's number one. I think the second thing is to understand the political and economic moment that we're in right now, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's historic recession, whether it's this moment of social justice, and understand that those are going to be the issues that will take they should take the priority of the next of the Biden administration. So, how does your issue, childhood hunger, for instance, mm-hmm. fit within that broader uh, framework? You know, I could easily make the argument that look, um, we had a hunger problem in this country before the pandemic, but the pandemic has certainly uh, exacerbated all of the economic inequities that we've had in this country, and now you see these like you know long lines of people at food banks, and this is an issue that even when the economy recovers the people at the bottom are always left behind. So if you frame it in that broader sense, as well as sort of the broader sense of like the social justice movement, which is not just about police brutality, but it's also about persistent racial inequalities. And obviously hunger is one of those things that plays into that. You'll have a greater chance of success. Um, The third thing I'd say is um, make sure that this concept, these proposals you're pushing are part of the broader political and media ecosystem. And what I mean by that mm-hmm. is that the first time the transition or the new administration hears about the idea should not be when you hand a piece of paper to them. There should be op-eds on this. Um, you can get right. you know, uh, petitions. Uh, you can get social media campaigns. You might even be able to get a member of Congress to give a floor statement or introduce a piece of legislation on this. But the more places, you know, it's like planting seeds. The more places you can plant seeds, um, the more likelihood Um, that this becomes part of the broader uh, political conversation. And then I think the last thing I'd say is whatever proposal you're pushing, make sure it's actionable. Uh, Nobody, frankly, has time to read 50-page white papers. Um, Obviously, you want a description of what you're talking about, but describe it in terms of this is a bill that you could introduce. This is a regulation that you could promulgate. This is an executive order you could put out there. This Here's the budget proposal that the president, the new president needs to put in their first budget, which comes out in February. Um, 
And to the extent you can sort of make it actionable, then just simply write it out. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that people on the right, the think tanks are remarkably good at basically just writing out an entire executive order, handing it to the White House and having them issue it. So make yeah. it as easy as possible to implement. Yeah, yeah. That's that's wonderful advice. That's great advice. Um, you know, as cabinet secretary, you were the liaison between the White House and the uh, federal agencies. Um, what what is important for people to understand about that dynamic, about how they work together, and um, uh, how can how can the general public use the federal agencies more effectively to use to move their agendas? Yeah, you know, I remember talking to one of our um, cabinet members uh, during the first term of the Obama administration, and it was a former governor. And I said, how is this job different than being a governor? And this cabinet member said, well, when I was the governor, I was the boss. I'm not the boss anymore. Uh, the it's not just the president. The White House staff tells me what to do. OMB tells me what to do. Uh, right. And so Congress tells me what to do. Um, so understanding that, you know, uh, you're all part of a broader team. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, if uh, I always used to tell the, the agencies, if there's a really good, you know, policy announcement, really good grant announcement, uh, I'm pretty sure the president's going to uh, going to want to take it from you. Uh, and you need to accept that. And that's not a bad thing. You know, having the president do anything means greater exposure, more press, but understanding that you're one part of a broader team and that, you know, the, the White House should not be surprising the agencies. The agency should not surprise the White House. Right. Um, and, you know, we all move in sync towards the same uh, broader goal, but also understanding, I think too many people in Washington put um, their faith for policy change in Congress or in the White House and don't understand that, at least in the executive branch, mm -hmm. all of the action is in the agencies. Agencies right. have all the money to spend. They have all the rulemaking authority. They have all the enforcement powers. They're the ones that can issue sub-regulatory guidance. Um, and so um, not enough people sort of focus their lobbying efforts broadly um, on what the federal agencies are doing. And ultimately, you can actually have a greater impact if you get an agency to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, your, it's so interesting, your first comment about uh, um, um, what governors learn when they become secretaries. And it, it seems to be one of the biggest misconceptions about, you know, entering the federal government at that level. And um, I remember in um, serving under Secretary Sebelius and every week we were on a call with the cabinet secretary's office, letting uh, the White House know what we were doing for the week. And every week, you know, we'd update and um, have a conversation about what, how the schedule would roll out. And I think it's, it is one of the biggest challenges for especially governors when they go into the uh, position of secretary is uh, realizing how that dynamic works. Yeah, you know, we used to, I, I ran the Office of Cabinet Affairs. Every Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, all of the major federal agencies would send us a report of what they were doing the following week, whether it was speeches, travel, policy announcements, uh, grant announcements, whatever. And we would take a look at, you know, 30, 40 reports and we match them up against each other and try to deconflict them, try to, you know, um, uh, make sure that uh, similar announcements were complementing each other um, and, you know, flagging things. I mean, I, you know, look, this is an administration, this current one, that's had its ethical issues. And right. I suspect that if, um, you know, they had a functioning cabinet secretary office uh, in the White House, you would be able to see all of these different trips. You'd see the things that uh, the Trump cabinet was doing, and you could probably have stopped some of the things from happening. Um, yeah, but you have to understand you are, you are frankly part of a team and um, you take instructions when you're the agency from the White House you know, and, and mm -hmm. I've been on both sides of this, this, and I've been at an agency where I've been told you must do X by the White House or you cannot do X. And, you know, it can be a frustrating experience. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, councils and White House initiatives. You chaired the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. 
And I'm wondering and thinking about also the White House Council on Women and Girls, like, are those um, effective tactics that people can consider as far as um, how to get their issue um, in front of the public, in front of, of, of legislators, um, to have a better understanding of, of what it is that they're um, trying to achieve? What yeah, you, you know, I, I think these councils are remarkably uh, effective. And I think um, not only the Council on Women and Girls, I think about Mrs. Biden and doc, uh, Dr. Biden and Mrs. Obama's initiative on joining forces, which I thought was amazingly successful. Um, Mrs. Obama's Let's Move initiative. You know, so much of this is, and to be fair, I mean, there were, there were not necessarily new resources and new staff. It was bringing together people in the White House and the agencies to create these ad hoc task forces to focus the energies of the federal government. And people forget so much of the federal government is really stovepiped. Like, for instance, um, we worked relentlessly on trying to reduce veterans' homelessness um, in the Obama administration. Uh, but that's not just a VA issue. HUD plays a role in all this DOD. Labor plays an issue. Education plays an issue in this. And so we would convene meetings on a regular basis to, to figure out how we could best sync up our programs. And it's not just syncing up. It's the convening power. Um, mm -hmm. And the meetings that Dr. Biden and Mrs. Obama did to bring experts together to highlight an issue can almost have as powerful catalyzing impact, particularly when it comes to something like Joining Forces did, which was right. to encourage private sector companies to hire veterans. Um, and, and when you say, you know, we're going to do a meeting at the White House with the First Lady, believe me, a lot of companies will sign up and, and say, we're going to hire a thousand veterans in order to be uh, part of that uh, policy announcement. Mm -hmm. That's great. So there's a question that's come in that I, I have a feeling you will have some very thoughtful um, insight on. And um, it's from Katie. Uh, forgive me for mispronouncing your last name, Katie Knees. Um, some candidates don't want registered lobbyists as political appointees. Many lobbyists are national content experts. Can you speak to this issue? Yeah, I think, I think history will record um, that uh, when the uh, Obama campaign in 2008 was making this pledge about uh, uh, ethics and lobbyists that uh, uh, there there was opposition. I was opposed to it. Um, mm -hmm. I thought it was a mistake. Um, and and I look, I'm I, I I think what we need to understand is this. I mean, there is an unfortunate revolving door between people serving in government, whether it's the legislative branch or the executive branch, and then leaving one day and then going and lobbying the offices that they served in. So I, I think the ethics requirements that we put in place in the Obama administration are absolutely correct. We should be serving in government for the right reason. But I do think when you create a blanket rule on lobbyists not serving in government, you leave a lot of really good people um, out uh, of government. Um, you know, and, and again, I think we need to be clear that, you know, um, you ought not to be able to work at an agency that regulates your former employer, you ought not to be, and in fact, you are legally permitted, prohibited from working on a matter um, that you handled uh, when you were in the private sector. All of that being said, um, simply in my opinion, simply because you are a lobbyist should not disqualify you. Um, and in the Obama administration, to be fair, we did issue waivers to people, um, to lobbyists. And uh, it was controversial when we had the, the rule uh, on lobbyists and it was controversial when he issued the waiver. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's it's a reflection of where we are politically right now, but I'm not sure it's uh, the best outcome for getting the best people in government. Yeah. And you've made the really valid point that, you know, there are some issues that really it's 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 good that they have a lobbyist, you know, protecting children is is a, a reasonable thing to lobby for and shouldn't fighting be for civil rights fighting for food <laughs> right. fighting for uh, residents of low income housing i mean my god these are people who need lobbyists right <laughs> right um we have another question here uh not sure exactly what the name but it says um if you are a national large organization that has multiple policy priorities you want to share with the transition team how do you best recommend we do that? Policy agenda, memo? Yeah, I think like I think a memo is perfectly fine, but I think again, it goes back to the idea of 
Um, you know, no one has time for a 50 page white paper, mm -hmm. um, a memo sort of laying out the problem, laying out your recommendations, and then as much as possible, actionable steps that they can take. Also understand this, like, again, I, people may disagree with me. Um, you can't say we have 50 uh, top tier priority issues. It really does help to sort of prioritize you know, tier one, tier two, uh, tier two, and tier three. And I know that there's probably an institutional resistance to doing that because you don't want to say, you know, particularly in a document that might be made public, these things are less important to us than other things. Right. Um, maybe a way to phrase that or simply just, you know, you'll have to be a little judicious in leaving things off. Or if you're going to carry water on a certain tier of issues, you have other groups, affiliated groups carry it on another set of issues. Um, I would also say this. To the extent that there's, and, and I'd say this with regard to personnel recommendations as well, mm -hmm. to the extent that you are going to put forward recommendations and you think that there may be groups that are going to be opposed to this, again, I mean, it's not like if you put forward a pro-labor agenda, you know the chamber is going to be probably opposed to that. I'm not saying that. Let's say you put forward an environmental proposal and you think that organized labor might have issues. I think as much as possible to the extent you're able to work out some of those disagreements or at least flag them or at least come up with some consensus proposal, mm -hmm. um, I think is incredibly useful because it is hard when you're sitting either in a transition or in an administration and you get two sets of proposals from two groups who are both, um, you know, uh, you're ideologically aligned with. I mean, the perfect example is organized labor and the environmental groups. And, 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 and one says do X, the other one says don't do X. Um, that's, that's hard. And again, I mean, that is part of our job in the White House to, to reconcile these things. And, and maybe, maybe your views are incompatible on a certain set of issues, but to the extent, to the extent that there is a, a set of common things you agree on, then put forward those things. Um, mm -hmm. because that's really something that, uh, people in a new administration, like if you've already worked at the politics among yourselves and you give me a strong policy pr uh, proposal, that's going to have a greater likelihood of me doing something with that than, than, than me having to reconcile these policy and political differences. Right. It, and it speaks to the power of coalitions and taking the time to build coalitions and um, how effective they can be. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And I, and I'd say, <clears throat> Um, particularly when you're dealing with uh, progressives, to the extent you can get as many different people in that progressive ecosystem bought into your ideas uh, would be useful. Mm -hmm. how, can, um, how can your congressional members factor into all of this? How should people be uh, uh, leveraging them better? Oh, I, I, I think they're critical in all of this. I mean, I think, you know, recognize that you know, if we're talking about a transition or we're talking about a new administration, you know, whoever the domestic policy uh, council director is or the NEC director is going to have a stack of policy proposals on their desk. Uh, but but trust me, if, if one of these comes from a member of Congress, particularly, you know, a chairman of an appropriating or authorizing committee, <laughs> that proposal sort of goes to the top. Um, <laughs> and, and, and to the extent that it has, and, and obviously you, you want to again, as you work at the politics of all of this to, to flag that, you know, these members are supportive of this concept because they've introduced legislation on this. Right. Um, you know, that just helps again with another level of the checking that we always need to do in the white house. Like what is going to be the Hill reaction? What's going to be the reaction of outside stakeholders? Uh, what's the press reaction going to be? Um, and so I think to the extent you can get as much of that figured out, I think is useful. And in particular, if you're able to get a member of Congress to forward the proposal, uh, it has a to, to the transition team. It is a greater chance of it being considered. Sure. Okay. And we have a question from Christy Lowe. Uh, what is the optimal time to share priorities with the transition team? So I would say that there's not there's not just one time you should seek it. As I said, uh, the first time they hear about it should not be when you send them a, a memo after election day. Um, if you've got something important right now, you should be sending it to the campaign. This should be part of the campaign's website, part of their policy platform, something that the candidate talks about on the campaign trail. Um, you know, this is something that should be, as I said, 
it should be, you know, something to the extent you can get congressional support, the, the fact that you can get op-eds to create a little buzz about it. I think that's useful. Mm -hmm. um, I think at this point, uh, the Biden transition team probably is not in the business of doing much public outreach and accepting proposals. So I would probably wait until after election day and knock on wood, they prevail. Um, I think that they probably will create a formal process for both submitting those ideas, as well as convening meetings with outside groups to discuss their priorities. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because that's a, uh, how we at the Raven Group spend a lot of our time as a public affairs and public policy <laughs> firm. You know, we help our clients uh, build out that strategy and position those um, op eds and place those um, conversations and have those meetings so that your issue can get some visibility um, and and create a, a strong foundation for the the presentation that you might uh, consider making to um, an administration or a transition team. So, and let me give you an example, um, Jessica. You know, in two thousand nine, three weeks after we took office, uh, obviously in the middle of the Great Recession, um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was um, mm -hmm. uh, passed by Congress. Uh, $800 billion stimulus package. Uh, about one third of it was tax cuts. One third was assistance to state and local governments. The other third was kind of the quote unquote shovel ready projects that Vice President Biden sort of oversaw to make sure money went out the door. Mm -hmm. If you go through that, you know, let's say a quarter trillion dollars of money, there are, there's money for all kinds of priorities that were sort of longstanding priorities of Democrats. Um, and in the crafting of that legislation, so much of the deference of the Obama team was to members of Congress. Mm -hmm. So just, just for instance, on an area like clean energy, I was just looking at the bill today, there was funding for home weatherizations, advanced battery technology for cars, uh, 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 clean energy jobs, uh, solar panels, uh, wind energy. Um, and so, you know, whoever... I'm sure behind each one of these proposals was an advocacy group that had either uh, um, right. put this in front of the transition or more importantly, put this in front of Congress. Because when we developed that bill, we went to Congress and said, look, we want to both create jobs, but use it in a way that pushes some of our progressive goals on clean energy. Mm -hmm. What are the best ideas that people have? So, um, uh, so yes, there are many ways to get into the door and get your proposals um, before the relevant people. Yeah, and you know, and speaking with you today, Chris, it's really um, what keeps coming to mind for me is how do we get um, the average citizen um, who just cares about something, or even the organizations, mm -hmm. both large and small, to um, get their government to work better for them. You know, there's so little understanding about all those resources that exist. And, you know, what are some of the immediate things that come to your mind on how we can help people understand what government is here to do for them, the federal government? You know, I candidly, I mean, Jessica, I think this is one of the failures of the Democratic Party is that, you know, we've gotten into this <clears throat> debate with the other side about big government versus limited government instead of having the right government, having government that mm -hmm. works effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I often, you know, think about whenever we come close to a government shutdown, which, you know, we may get to um, if we don't get some something done before the end of this month. Um, what we've done as Democrats is that we've essentially exempted all of the functions that deal with the public mm -hmm. from any kind of shutdown. And, and I've often thought that yeah, I mean, we do that because it's the right thing to do because we don't want, uh, you know, we want we don't want air travel to stop because TSA uh, screening people are not available. But right. the truth is, I think the American people don't understand how often their lives are touched on a day to day basis. Whether it's the food you ate today that was inspected by a USDA inspector, whether it's going to work and being safe because you had OSHA inspectors there, whether it's the funding that goes to education or the funding that goes to healthcare or your social security check, your veterans check. Essentially now, the American people, whenever we have a shutdown, unless they're trying to go to a national park or the Smithsonian, they really don't understand that like the government has shut down because we've exempted all of the things that government does. Um, and so, I, look, it is one of my hopes that, you know, with another Democratic administration, we do 
a better job of highlighting why government matters because I don't think most people appreciate that in any way. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so um, we've talked so much about a lot of things, and and I I think <laughs> probably what we could do to um, oh can I, I can yeah. I can I add something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> now, now I'm just teeing up my own topics because this is okay. Jeff and I had talked about. No, um, personnel recommendations is something that that's we where it was going. Yes, we had not focused on personnel recommendations. Yes. Um, let me just say this for outside groups. Um, there is a lot of attention is given to the cabinet, right? And um, I'm already starting to see these stories about who might be in a Biden cabinet. Um, if you want to, if you want to have some fun. Go back 12 years ago and look at the stories about who might be in an Obama cabinet. And mm -hmm. I think virtually none of the predictions were correct. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a little bit like if you're a basketball fan, uh, people, when they do these kind of pieces on predictions, it's yeah. like they're trying to assemble an NBA all-star team. Like right. that's not how cabinets are. We don't <laughs> just have like, you right. know. We don't have Kobe and LeBron and all these other people. I mean, you've got some shooters, you got some rebounders, you got a bunch of people that make a team. Yeah. Uh, and particularly in a Democratic administration, diversity matters. Mm -hmm. um, it would not surprise me that a Biden cabinet has, you know, 50% women, right. that it doesn't have a, a large number of people of color. Mm -hmm. Um and yes, there's always, you know, governors and senators and members of Congress, but there are often also, you know, um, there are uh, uh, business leaders and people from philanthropy and state and local leaders and all kinds of things. So um, a lot of attention is focused on the cabinet, but also understand that um, the president will care deeply who is in his cabinet. And, right. um, you know, uh, it, that's not an area where I think can easily be influenced by people on the outside, where I think there is more potential for influence is in sub cabinet positions, particularly in those really specialized positions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think about like back in 2008, because it was the first transition post 9-11, we were very concerned about homeland security positions. But I suspect in this coming administration, public health jobs, CDC, right. FDA, are right. going to be really important yes. uh, in a way that they weren't 12 years ago. And, and I think as much as possible, outside groups coming to the table with, you know, look, if you've served in government like, you know, Jessica and I have, you know, yeah, I mean, you can certainly feel free to nominate me for anything. Um, but I think more importantly, who are the next generation of leaders? Mm -hmm. Who are the people that are doing really great work in state and local government? People outside the beltway. Right. When you come to the table with people like that, particularly diverse people. Boy, that that is a huge asset to the transition team. Yeah, yeah, such a great point. Um, and we have another question that's come in from Crystal Martinez. Given that we face a public health crisis and an economic depression, how much of the activity in the first 100 days do you predict will be cleaning up versus carrying out visionary policymaking? That is a great question. Yeah, I uh, first of all, I hope this is my my former staffer, Crystal Martinez. Um, and and if it is, then thank you for asking the question. <laughs> um, I, I think it's gonna. Frankly, I think it's gonna have to be uh, both. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is something that the vice president has talked about, and that's what Build Back Better means. It doesn't mean just take us back to where we were before the pandemic, because even before the pandemic, we had record. Um, a record uh, performance on Wall Street, and we had rising income inequality, rising number of people with health and without health insurance. So we need to do better. So I think it's going to have to require, um, obviously, rebuilding what, what what has been lost with these um, now 29 million people on unemployment and these hundreds of thousands of small businesses uh, that are shuttered. Uh, but how do we start to address some of these underlying problems in our society, both social and economic. And so sadly, it's going to have to be both. And I think as much of anything, it's also going to require rebuilding the federal government. I mean, we have seen over the past three and a half years, the exodus of scientists and experts, particularly in the area of climate science. We've seen the exodus of uh, foreign service officers. 
Um, and so we're going to have to be, you know, whoever staffs this next administration is going to have to be juggling a lot of things at once. Yeah, that is a lot of juggling. And, you know, now um, considering everything that we are going through, it's it's an opportunity to get some things right, you know. It's... No, I think that's right. And I think, look, um, you know, I, I one of the proudest things I will ever have worked on is, oh, proudest things I've accomplished is helping to work on the Affordable Care Act. And boy, yeah. that is such a revolutionary piece of legislation, but it it's not enough. Right. Um, and, and, and we need to do more to, to, to bring down costs, to expand coverage, uh, to provide more protections to people. And I hope we do that. Yes. Thank you. Um, and Crystal says, hi. Yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, trust me, I did not, I did not set her up with that question, but it's good <laughs> to see my former staffer on here. No. And let's, um, you know, when we're talking about appointments and, you know, we focused primarily on those more senior roles but there's, there's also, you know, I came into the federal government as more of a, a junior um, level. And I always think about that it was, it, it really was one of the best experiences, experiences that I had ever had. And the sense that, you know, I went from state government to federal government, then to local. And what I was able to bring to local government was so much more um, enriching than it might have been had I not had that previous experience. So, uh, what would you say to young people who um, are, you know, not so sure that they want to be a part of the federal government and what they could get out of it? Look, I will tell you that it, working in the federal government can be an amazingly frustrating experience. Um, I remember uh, going into, I mean, this will now, I mean, I you go into the Department of Labor building and there is no. Wi-Fi widely in the building, um, unless, <laughs> unless they've put it in since I left, which I don't think they did. Uh, or I remember walking into the White House in 2009. You know, we had desktop computers, we had no laptops. You didn't have the ones that you could sort of detach from the right. computers. And so, um, it's the antiquated uh, technology. It's the um, challenges of hiring, uh, promoting, and firing the people you want to. It's the budgetary challenges. It is. Um, um, it is all the bureaucracy. It's the constant oversight from the Hill and the press. All of that aside, um, there is no better way to make a difference in people's lives than government. Right. And, and oftentimes it is hard to see the impact, particularly when you're at the federal government. It's hard to see the impact of the work that you're doing, but know that it matters. But then again, I always tell people, young people, particularly coming out of you know, college or public policy schools, if you really want to make a difference, I'm a huge proponent of state and local government because mm -hmm. you can actually see what you're doing. Um, but but it is, look, if, if you have the ability to serve and you're given that opportunity, do it. Um, yeah. do it for a year, do it for two years. It, it will transform you. And I think as importantly, it'll give you a set of skills that will make you better in what a, what a uh, other profession you decide to pursue. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have another question from Michael Tora. There are several, several Republican led campaign organizations supporting Biden for president. If Biden wins, do you think he'll feel the need to appoint a number of Republicans to senior and mid level roles? You know, I think he's going to, I think the answer is yes, but I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to give a kind of a, um, I, I'm going to dodge a little bit and simply say, I think he's going to point the best people to the jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was proud in the Obama administration that, you know, I think one of our most popular and most effective cabinet members was Ray LaHood, a Republican uh, member of Congress from Illinois. Uh, yeah. We had a lot of Republicans that served in the Obama administration from people like, you know, uh, uh, Secretary Gates, Secretary Hagel, um, John McHugh, uh, our, our Secretary of the Army. Um, uh, and we had ambassadors that were Republicans. I mean, look, I, I think given the challenges that our country faces, you want the best people at the table. Um, right. And this is, I think, frankly, it goes back to my answer about lobbyists. Um, I don't want to leave talent um, on on the side. I want I want the best possible people. And if you're in, if you're willing to support the president's agenda, and you're smart and you're experienced and you're willing to work hard. I, it, it look, it's not my decision, but I would not leave somebody aside be, because of their political party. 
Right. Well, that's a great place to start to wrap up. Thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. You know, the the federal government is is um, still quite mysterious to people, and um, I think it's any t- opportunity we can take to provide information um, so that people know how to navigate it better is is um, helpful. So any closing thoughts from you, Chris? No, I just wanna thank all of you, uh, well, the Raven Group, uh, you, Jessica, um, for convening this. I think it's an important conversation. You know, when I started planning Obama's transition in 2008, April of 2008, we never talked about transitions. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was seen as unseemly. It was measuring the drapes. It was, you know, spiking the football before you cross the goal line. Use your, you know, use your analogy, favorite analogy. I think- we have to do that because you are talking about um, the takeover of the largest organization and the most powerful one in the world, and also during a historically unprecedented time. Right. And so it's it's irresponsible not to have these conversations. And again, to solve the problems that we have in this country, we're going to need the best minds, and that includes all of the input from all of the people uh, on this uh, on this uh, uh, this call right now. So. It's an important conversation, so thank you for convening us. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you all for joining um, to share upcoming conversations that we'll be having. On September 22nd, we'll have policing from Rodney King to today with Roy Austin. On September 23rd, Senator Chris Murphy will be discussing his new book. And on our website, you can find a full schedule of all the events we have coming up. So thank you for joining us this afternoon.